Uh, so I'm going to talk about two different subjects today, and I'm not going to go into too much detail on any one of them, just to kind of give you an overview of what's going on on both the voting program and the bison program. Um, so most of this is just, you've already heard one way you know, or another from different people. I hopefully put a different little spin on it. But we've got about 50-some watersheds on Kanza. And what makes our burning a little more difficult than normal pasture burning is, we've got ungrazed watersheds right next to a grazed watershed. And the objective is to burn these at, at, uh, and keep the fire out of this one. And so it's, it's a little different attitude that we have to have considered with the uh, farmer attitude to have or just throw the match in the ditch and let it burn from ditch to ditch. Or, or taking the attitude that says, well, we don't have to worry about it going through the creek. The fire will stop at the creek. We can't do that. We have to be a lot more cautious about controlled burning, keeping the fire within the area that we want to keep it in. And a lot of our watersheds are ungrazed. And so when you have ungrazed watersheds, tremendous amount of fuel. This is a year in which there's a lot of fuel. And so consequently, hot fire is easy to get out of control. Most of our burning is dictated upon weather conditions. For the month, we start burning in uh, the first week of March, and we end up generally at the last week of April. And in those two months, we get on average of about 12 days in which we can safely burn. So far this, uh, uh, this March, we've had two, two burn days so far. And so the conditions that we, uh, that we are able to burn under is pretty strict. And, and one of the most important is the wind speed. We have to burn under 15 miles an hour. When you burn faster, uh, the wind's faster than 15, it becomes a lot harder to control, particularly in these ungrazed areas. And uh, I know on uh, farmers, they like to have winds a little bit higher than that because it'll carry through a grazed area. Grazed fuels are really patchy. And so you get a good wind speed and it blows through it. But anytime you have a high wind speed, it's a lot more difficult to control it and keep it away from areas you don't want it to burn. Wind direction is important. We're bounded by highways on two sides of Kanza, and it is imperative that we do not get smoke on the highway. Uh, that you'll find if you've lived in Kansas very long is there's two types of people when they see smoke on the highway. One that slow down or stop right in the middle of the highway because they can't see. And the other is we're going to speed up to get through the smoke. And invariably they will meet. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and so it, it, becomes, it becomes really dangerous to put smoke on the highway, and so we're very conscientious about that. So we, when we burn the Shane area and the cattle unit, we have to have an east wind. East winds are pretty uncommon for us, and so sometimes they get burned earlier in the year, and, and other times they don't uh, get burned until later. But uh, we burn down on the south, we have to have a south wind so we don't blow smoke on the interstate. So, a lot of the watersheds, though, we can burn on any kind of wind. But sometimes it's just a lot easier to burn with one particular wind direction than another. So uh, we kind of gear what we burn based upon uh, the wind's directions. Um, okay, to, to do our burning, it, we what is it's called uh, overkill. We have, uh, we have two tractors. Units with trailers, so, uh, they hold 300 gallons of water. A uh, small jump hose, it's a lead hose, a backup hose, a big three-quarter inch emergency hose, four drip tube, uh, torches, um, everything else we might need there, gasoline, fuel, uh, equipment. We have two, track, uh, two trucks that are also uh, likewise equipped that they follow them up. And we take a nose tank out with us so that we can fill up with water. We find when you burn, you always need water. You never have enough water. Back in the old days, we never had a nurse tank, and so when we ran out of water, we would either have to siphon it. You remember that, Myron? We'd have to siphon it out of, out of creeks, and we started sucking up endangered species. <laughs> so we had to quit that. <laughs> and, uh, and so we, we carry out a nurse tank with us so that we can uh, uh, 
uh, fill up after each uh, burn so that in, if anything happens, we have the water, the capabilities to take care of it. And so in order to do all this, we have a crew of about 16 people. And so most people that burn pasture look at, say, 16 people. That's overkill. They can't get 16 people. They get everybody in the whole county together to burn. But we have a, we, we have a requirement for a, a large crew numbers, and consequently, the county gives us a little more leeway when we want to burn because they say, well, they've got adequate equipment and they've got plenty of people. It's not just like the old rancher throwing out a, a match and calling up his neighbor and say, watch out, Jake, there's a fire coming toward you. <laughs> that that we, can, we can control what we like, and that's the whole idea of having all this equipment and all this people. Uh, and then just a quick uh, overview, we do most of our burning in the spring. And then that's one of those questions we put into is, when's the best time to burn? And it, true, it depends upon your objective, but the spring is, is really more ideal to burn than, than a lot of other times because you have a longer stretch of good weather normally. So we do most of our burning in spring. We have watersheds that are burned at one, two, four, and supposedly 20-year intervals. We do have two watersheds that we burn in uh, November, two that we burn in February, and two that we burn in July. Uh, the July summer burns, which I'll talk about them in a little bit, they're the ones that everybody really loves. Uh, what I really w would like to talk about is one of my favorite subjects is, uh, is burning, why we burn, when we burn it, and the reasoning behind it. And so I briefly want to talk, uh, jump back to about the 1860s when this area was being settled. There wasn't anything grazing in the grasslands. And the grass grew tall. And any time you got fire into the area, it was a dangerous situation. It would burn for miles and miles and miles. And so fire was generally regarded as being bad, dangerous, totally undesirable. Nobody knew anything about it. They just had the background of forestries. People and said, ah, they come in there, fire's bad for forest, so it must be bad for grasslands. So that was a general attitude, and K State actually had that same attitude, and they set up some plots in, uh, in the 1930s, and based upon uh, upper plots, they decided that uh, fire was bad, and you should not burn. And so from the 1930s all the way to the 1960s, Official recommendation from Kansas State University was we recommend that you do not burn your pasture. Extension agents would go out and say, don't burn. People who had um, uh, pastures that raised cattle got out the shotguns and said, get off my property because I know that that isn't the way you ought to be managing grasslands. But nevertheless, official policy was don't burn. By the mid-1960s, this attitude started moderating a little bit, and, and they said, okay, there's a lot of people that want to burn. If you think you ought to burn, go ahead and do it, but only do it in late spring, which is late April for us. So you do it at any other time, you're going to destroy your grassland. So if you want to burn, we recommend you don't, but if you do, do it in late April. Then about in the mid-60s, we had this massive explosion throughout the whole state <coughs> of cedar trees. And finally the people woke up and said, you know, we got to burn in order to keep the cedar trees out. If we don't maintain grasslands if we don't burn them. And so they, by, the, by the late 1960s, the whole attitude is, okay, you need to burn in order to keep grasslands. So, so in, a, in this period from the 30s to the late 60s, the attitude actually went from one extreme to the other, from don't burn to you got to burn. However, the attitude was the only time you can burn is late April. And that was based solely upon uh, upland plots that they had that was totally unreplicated, unreplicated plots. So after the 1960s when they said you got to burn, every time you'd go out, in the springtime, every newspaper, TV, um, radio ads, everything, and people would go out and say, I know you guys are getting antsy to burn, but don't burn. Because if you burn at any time other than late spring, you're going to destroy your pasture. One of the things that scare people with this is that the first thing they say, you lose 15% biomass production if you burn early. Burn early was 
actually uh, March 20, uh, according to the plot button. This was actually based upon a, a plot study that they had on Upland Prairie in which there was a difference in 12% uh, biomass production between early spring burn plot and a late spring burn plot. So they just rounded it up and said, well, you're going to lose 15% every year. No matter what, you're going to lose 15%. Well, and that's biomass too. That's grass, forbs, and woodies combined together. And then they would say, if you burn early, you need to reduce your stocking by 25%. The logic was never there. If you're only going to lose 15% biomass production, why do you need to cut uh, stocking weight by 25%? Uh, but this is what they would tell people. They would also say that you're going to have this uh, massive invasion of cool season plants. Uh, you're going to lose all your warm season grasses, and it's going to turn into a weed patch. And then finally they say you've got to burn in late spring in order to get rid of the woodies. If you burn early, you're not going to kill the woodies. Well, you already know that uh, you don't kill the woodies uh, unless you unless it's red cedar, but uh, with fire and any kind. But there's all exceptions to that. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, so this is, this this was what the standard was that every year for 40 years now from the 70s, 80s, 90s, and the 2000s, this is what Extension was putting out, the information says, don't burn. When, when I came uh, to Kanza, uh, I was able to convince them that we need to set up some burning studies, rather than just a small pop study. And so we set up these winter burns, uh, uh, the uh, February burns, November burns, and, and summer burns, and to actually do it come on a comparative basis, burn them in uh, distinctly different times. This is the average burn date for the 20 years in which we've been doing it. And we looked at both uplands and lowland topographic positions because sometimes just because a plant responds one way on an upland may uh, not respond the same way if it's on a lowland. So we looked at, uh, and we replicated two watersheds each. And this is the only study that had never been done on a, a, a large basis that was replicated. So everything up until this point was based upon a, a small plot on upland trip, unreplicated. So all the information on how, how Kansas ought to burn is based upon a small plot. Just remember. So this information is, uh, is uh, uh, replicated watersheds, and it currently is the longest study that's ever been done on burning in a large area, non pot area. So I want to show you briefly a little bit of data just so you can kind of get the feel of, of uh, what the data actually looks like. I'm not going to bore you too much with uh, this information, but to point out some highlights. Big blue stem, which is what most people really want to have if you've got pasture increases under all burning issues. <laughs> And uh, it did so also on lowlands. I, I just put out some of these slides that um, did show uh, both topographic positions on them. And Indian grass, this is really interesting because Indian grass is the second most common grass. Loves spring burning. Doesn't decrease under fall or winter burning, but loves spring burning. However, look at it, it took seven years before it really took a jump up. So just one burn didn't do it. It took a while before it finally cranked in and started burning. But if, if your objective is to do whatever you can to favor Indian grass, then yeah, you want to be burning in late spring. Late spring, yeah, just think of, of late April. Little blue stem, uh, uh, mid grass, and so this is the uplands. Uh, because that's where it's most common. Increases like heck in the fall and winter burning. Loves fall and winter burning. <coughs> Spring burning, no change over time. On lowlands, the response was a little bit different. Uh, it actually decreased the spring burning on lowland burning. So if you want to increase little blue stem, if that's your objective, then you want to be burning in fall and winter. Switchgrass. I hate switchgrass, but um, <laughs> it likes burning at any time. 
Hey, Gene, you said that Indian grass was the second most abundant warm season grass. Right. What's the most abundant warm season grass out here? Big boots. Why do you hate switch grass? It's way overrated of how good, good it is. It's not palatable. It's not one of the most palatable type grasses. Uh, but people think switchgrass is so great, but it, if you was a cow, <laughs> <laughs> if you was a cow, it would not be near your top choice. I think and so I think cow. I think cow. Gamma grass, yeah, but we don't have much of that out in the That's a constant increase on all, almost all those grasses over the last right. 20 years. 20 years. So, from 94 back to where we opened in 70, was it really bad then or no. really low? Well, well, see, what it was, these watersheds in, that I had used for this uh, signal burn used to be four year watersheds. Back in the old days, they believed that four year burning was the most likely occurrence for this uh, prairie. In the, the long, every four years it was burned on average. So most of the burn treatments out here were four years. We had an overabundance of four-year pastures. So when we set this up, all these were four-year pastures, just about every one of the watersheds. Uh, I won't get too much into four-year watersheds. In fact, I think I pulled that slide. Jill said I had too many slides, so I pulled my four-year watersheds out because it was a, I was going to talk about them. Uh, and so it, they were, they were there generally uh, not great. A number, but it was it, it was still good for me. It just wasn't as good. And so, yeah, what happens if they, they increase? You don't look at this one, but on the others, and then like on the Indian grass, it starts leveling off because at some point it can't always it continually increase. June grass. This is our native cool season perennial grass. This is a desirable grass. This is a good grass, but it's a uh, it's a mid grass. It doesn't get that tall. If you go out into your fall and winter uh, watersheds on the upland prairies, all that green stuff, bunch grass, is June grass. It it just exploded. It likes it. It does not like spring burning, and, and at this point in time, it's gone. It started out low, one percent, but there's none in there now. It does not like spring burning. But so if your objective is you want to. Uh, have some cool season grasses out there that are native. Fall and winter burning is what you need to be thinking about. Not definitely spring burning because it is not favorable for it at all. Sedges, they function just like uh, the uh, June grass. Increase like heck under fall and winter burning. Decline to almost z zero levels under spring burning. So what you're doing with this spring burning, you're eliminating these cool season plants, the sedges and the, and the cool season grasses, you you eventually eliminate them with spring burning. Now, you, you said something under your breath about June grass. Is June grass not palatable? No, June, June grass is good grass. Okay. In fact, in the 1926, uh, when they set up these uh, plots in agronomy, they did an initial study in June grass. And this was up on prairie. And June grass was basically an upper plant. So I'll get the end though. I gotta finish with my train of thought or I'll get sidetracked. And um, and June grass was the second most abundant grass on that upper prairie. It was over twenty percent June grass. And that is just pretty much indicative of the fact that uh, this that grassland anyway had been burned frequently in early spring. In fact, it was not at all uncommon uh, back in the 1880s, 1890s for uh, ranchers to go burning in, the, uh, in January, February. In fact, they even used to say burn with the snow cover on, just so that you wouldn't quote unquote damage the crown of the plants. Now I take a question in back. Uh, does the spring burning affect cool season forbs similarly to the grass? Yeah, and I'll get to that in a minute. Okay. I, I think maybe on my next slide's forbs. That's one of them. Uh, this is not a cool season forb, but I, I absolutely love this graph because it illustrates the importance of long-term data if you want to make any conclusions about the effect of fire. 
You send a PhD student out to go look in the fall and winter watersheds and see how Wagweed is responding. And so they go out in 04, 05, and 06. They collect three years of data and publish the data and say, man, we have got evidence beyond a shadow of a doubt that fall and winter burning increases the heck out of ragweed, spring burning dough. But if it went out in 94, 95, 96, 97, <coughs> or 01, 02, 03, and took that data, they would have exactly the opposite conclusion. So the importance of long-term data, it's not the file itself that is favoring ragweed or affecting it, it's it's combination of the, the file and precipitation patterns. So they fluctuate widely from year to year, and some years fall and winter burning definitely is better for ragweed. But it's not anything you can say and be confident about and say, if you burn early, you're going to have higher ragweed concentrations. Because I guarantee you we did it here. So uh, it, it's just important that you need long-term data in order to know what's going on with these plants. It's not always just something directly with uh, the file. There's lots of interactions with the environment. Woody species, we started out with a low number of woody species, only roughly four woody species, were, which wasn't bad because this was, this was before really the heavy invasions. 20 years of burning did not change the number of woody species. We still had the same number of species after 20 years of burning, no matter when it was burned. So just when they say, well, you've got to burn in late spring to knock out your woodies, you're not knocking them out. They're still there. And this is number of species. Number of species. This is a cover. The cover of the woody species still started out pretty low, 6-7%. And there was a gradual decline in the cover of, in fall burning, a, a decline in spring burning, and the fluctuations from year to year, but uh, uh, basically no change at all from winter burning. The point is here for 20 years that there's only a small change in the woody cover. And so this is the accumulated cover of all the woody species. So I want to I want to point out a little bit on this. Uh, we used to have a watershed, this was called 20A. It's now called the reversal watershed, uh, R1A. This was burned every year. This was unburned. We switched them in 2001, which we started burning this one every year. We started uh, leaving this one unburned. So the, <coughs> this data then is uh, the uh, average of this watershed, and then we had another watershed, so it's replicated uh, treatment. And then just for your uh, comparison, this was the fall, winter, and spring uh, changes in the woody cover. And this is what it was from the, in 2000 when we uh, had the uh, uh, watershed before we reversed the fire treatment. Started out 22% woody cover, which is a decent amount. You can see this is woody, but it's not anything at all like 4B or, or some of those really junk watersheds. So 20, because uh, 4B has 87% woody cover. But 22% um, is a lot, but it's not, it's not that bad. We started out with 22, the first burn knocked it down to 16 cover, and then it fluctuated around for a couple of years, then it dropped to 10%, and then it's kind of stayed the same, 13 burns, it's it's uh, twelve percent. So it went from twenty two to twelve percent in thirteen years of annual burning. This was late spring burning. So if you if you say okay, it took thirteen years to get from this point to this point. We know it took twenty years to get from this point to this point. In order to get it any further downhill, you if for this to get down the hill, you're talking about forty to fifty years of annual burning. And the first time you don't burn it, then you get a, a jump up, back up. And you stop, basically you kind of stop back all over. <laughs> so the point is on this, is once you get the woodies, you may knock them back. Well, you will knock them back. But you ain't going to get rid of them with fire alone. You know? We've still got a lot of, you don't see any of these woody islands here. Well, here's a woody island, but that's down in the low ones. You still got these woody islands. The files gradually eating into it, these dark wood islands, and knocking them back. So they're still there, but instead of the, the uh, dogwood being six foot tall 
and 10 feet wide, so this foot tall, this tall, and scatter all over it. So if you don't know dogwood when it's in the non-woody form, then they say, well, I got rid of all my woodies. Well, you didn't get rid of them. You just put them down to a basis form. Okay, so the most, most people don't care about the plant composition per se. They, all they're interested in is the biomass production. Most people meaning like the ranches. So we went at the uh, end of the season and clipped all the grasses. I, I'm not showing the uh, annual fluctuations from year to year. This is just the 20th uh, average for on the upper prairie. Absolutely no difference in the amount of grass produced from any of the birds, which is totally opposite of everything agronomy had taught for 40 years from their part. In which it, they, they said there was big time differences in biomass production. Absolutely no difference in grass production from a, uh, upland watershed, lowlands, absolutely no watershed uh, differences, not even close to being significant. Look at Forbes. Uh, Forbes lowest in spring growth, both uplands and lowlands. And so you, you do have more forbs when you burn in fall and winter. But having more forbs is not necessarily bad if you know what those forbs are. And I pulled out some of my slides. In fact, that's why I avoided your question. Now, I remember I pulled those slides out <laughs> on, on the forbs. Because <laughs> Jill said, you've got to cut this down shorter. So I uh, blame Jill. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, I'm taking care of people's bladders. <laughs> So uh, you, get, you do have more forbs, but it, the, uh, generally forbs like asters. The asters like fall and winter burning. Um, so um, that's just, just because you have more forbs means you have uh, not necessarily bad. Uh, quickly, I want to talk about this because this is really cool. Everybody really gets turned on by uh, flowering fields, and I didn't I didn't show the changes over years because some years. We have good flowering yields in which it's out there and the grass is, everything's flowering it looks like. So this is just the average stems, flowering stems, uh, on upland prairie for the 20 years. No difference at all in, in big blue stem. On whether it looks better in fall, winter, or spring, as far as what the average uh, flowering is. And we do know that big blue stem is stimulated by, fly, uh, by burning. So that if you go look at a burned watershed, it always has more big blue stem flowering than a non-burned watershed. But there's no difference over the long term between when that watershed might have been burned. So that Indian grass, no difference fall and wintering. Uh, spring burning had twice as much flowering stems for Indian grass as fall and winter. And, and, um, but, but both of these are uh, they, they occur on uplands, but they're much, much more common on lowlands. This is a common upland prairie, little blue stem, uh, much higher flowering on fall and winter than on uh, spring. This last year was the flowering year for little blue stem. Uh, we had, I think, uh, seven, what? we had uh, 63. 63 flowering little blue stems per meter squared in uh, the fall and winter for the watersheds. Well, and that's a lot, a meter squared, 63 of them, that's a lot. Particularly when the average is 15. And then you look down at the lowlands, again, not much difference between big blue stem, a uh, little difference between uh, little blue stem, but not much. But I want to draw your attention in. Three times as much flowering when any grass for, for uh, spring burning and fall winter. So, spring burning, we, if you remember that it increased the heck out of any grass, it also increases the heck out of any grass flowering. So, uh, actually, uh, 2004, we had, uh, we had uh, 63 
allowing in ingress 10 per meter squared. And that is a lot of in ingress. So, uh, I guess the bottom line on this is that in ingress is, is the big one that responds to uh, spring burning in, in flowering. Uh, it can be argued, and I'm not going to get into it on this one, it can be argued, it says, well, why flower? Why should these grasses flower? They're wasting energy flowering because the main mode of reproduction is vegetatively, underground rhizomes. And that generally when they flower, most of that seed goes directly to feeding the mice. So, uh, and, and uh, most people don't want to do that. And I, I'm, I don't want to get into the philosophical arguments of it, of saying, well, yeah, it acts as a reserve and food and a bank, seed bank in the soil and all that. But most of the generation of new plants out in the prairie is not from these new grass seeds. It comes from uh, vegetative reproduction. So it could be argued, said, well, why even waste your time flowering? But if you're interested in flowering for a little while, uh, for any grass, then uh, and spring burning is what you want to be thinking about. Uh, a coefficient of, of uh, conservation is the um, is a method of kind of looking at the value of a plant, rather than assuming that all plants are created equal. This makes a judgment and says, well, plants are different. I'd much rather have uh, silk yaster than than have ironweed. And so it places value of plants based upon their response to disturbances. So plants that are uh, habitat in disturbed areas like ironweed, verbena, uh, some of these common annuals that grow anytime you dig up the soil that you see around, they have very low values because they say, well, they can grow anywhere. Some other plants that are much more sensitive to uh, disturbance, they have high values. So what you can do is then go through and, and inventory all the plants that you have and those values assigned to them based upon what state you're in. And then just uh, add those, the total uh, coefficients up, divide it by the number of species you added up and get a coefficient. And on this, this just kind of indicates that uh, with fall and winter burning, there was a gradual increase in uh, the coefficient over time and it maintained its level under spring burning. But what you can do is, and what's, what's common done now is to assess that so that you can pick, compare different areas with a fluoristic quality index, and that's just to take the coefficient. And, and multiply it by the square root of the number of species that you found. And this kind of gives you an indication of how good of an area that you have. Generally, they say anything, uh, well, they say it depends on who you talk to. 25 to 30 is considered a pretty good natural area as far as quality of plants. Anything about 30 to 35 is considered excellent. Anything about 35 is just super outstanding. And if, then if it's below 25, it's, it's kind of uh, indicates a disturbance that uh, is low quality. But all this says it indicates that over time, annual spring burning is maintained a plastic quality index. Just one, let me finish this. And that there's gradual increase in a plastic quality with fall and winter burning. Yeah. For a practical point of view, is there an indicator species that if you saw it, you'd say that's a healthy prairie? Uh, well, yeah, based upon the coefficients, uh, there, are all, there are all species that have really high coefficients. It goes up to 10. Uh, zero being ones like annual ragweed and, and, and some of these jump uh, ironweed, you get, you get a zero with them. And there's others like um, uh, purple prairie clover, white prairie clover, they're like fives. Uh, and I, I can't remember all the species. We, we didn't have any tens. Mead's milkweed is a ten. We, we don't have it, but uh, if you did have it, that means it's really, really sensitive to any disturbance. But it's also very indicative of high quality prairie. Well, we only had one 
uh, species that was a nine. Do you know it, Willie? Uh, no. Willie milkweed. Willie. Willie yeah. milkweed. Okay. That's a yeah. that was a, that's a nine, uh, and that was the closest we had. But most of the most of the others we had were like sevens and eights and stuff. It's just that they look at the the really low quality species, the ironweed and uh, snow on the mountain, and that. That those values, you say if you got a lot of those species, you don't have much of a coefficient because they're basically zeros. Most of them are zeros or ones. And so, uh, is, is there a reference? Yeah, well, I got mine off of uh, Craig Freeman at KU has, has developed. Uh, and this just wasn't a number he developed. He actually sent it out to people with throughout the state and says, okay, let's rate this. Let's, let's assign a value. And so the, you get very, very subjective whenever you want to assign a value. And I totally disagree with some of them because like they got Ceanothus, which I consider a junk woody plant. But it's considered a high plant. I mean, it's something like six or seven on the coefficients. So there's some, there's some plants that could be argued about how good they are. But if, if you're interested, I've got three yeah, minutes. I think but, this group would be interested in knowing. But it, it's just a way, it's, well, the, the, the big deal about it is if it gives every species for Kansas. And so you're looking through thousand plants. There's two people like that. <laughs> you know, but, but I think I have that on do my you? computer. Okay. okay. Right it to it. Yeah. Uh, but it, it's, it, this is becoming more and more used to compare people's uh, patch of land and say, well, mine's really good. Well, how do you know it's good? Just right. say, well, it's got big blue stem. Well, that don't mean it's good. What yeah. other plants do you have? So it's just assessing a value upon the plants. And, and so all I'm, all I'm wanting to illustrate with this is that by pouring winter burning, you actually increased this fluoristic quality and you just maintained it with spring burning. And, I, and, and that was simply because a lot of people think that farm winter burning is a way to degrade your prairie. And so what, what we're showing here is that it's not. Okay, so there's, there's other reasons to think about burning at different times other than spring other than just the plant. I, I talked about the biomass production, talked about the changes in species composition. But what happens right now is when um, agronomy gets out and says, okay, everybody, don't burn until late April. In fact, some people have got so extreme, they say, don't burn until April 28th at 10 a.m. in the morning. And that's how ridiculous it's got from some people. That if you do it at any other time, you're going to destroy your prairie or, or at least cause uh, problems with it. So what happens is, everybody gets out and burns at the same time. Because they've been taught this for 40 years now. Just keep in mind, they've been taught. Just like you go to church and they get lecture two. You get lecture two on this and the only time to burn. And that's people, I guarantee you, people that are even docents on cons and believe that the only time you can burn is late April. So everybody goes out and burns at the same time. Those massive amounts of smoke up in the air. And Kansas City and Wichita do the same thing that they did 150 years ago. People in the town say, why are those idiots burning? I don't like it. They don't need burn. And so then they get stuck getting the EPA and every government agency that they can think of that wants to regulate people on sticking their nose into it and saying, okay, you guys, if you don't straighten this up, we're going to straighten it up for you. We can tell you when to burn or if you can burn. So, the <laughs> spreading the burning out to different times is a way to kind of avoid that whole problem. That sometimes, particularly if you have a, a stretch in, in April of a rainy weather and nobody can burn, the first good day it comes out, everybody in the county is burning. Matt dump massive amount of smoke in the air, and I guarantee you it's going to cause problems, and the, and the EPA is going to start looking at it and say, hey, you guys got to quit doing that. So it's a way to spread out this whole uh, smoke management issue. 
Then it can be important for a lot of people is when you burn in late April, you kill a lot of snakes. You kill a lot of toads. Now I know there's a lot of people that say good. <laughs> but uh, heck, I, I used to be a herpetologist and I like snakes. And uh, you know, it, it's just something sad to see about it. You, you burn a watershed off and you go out there and find five snake bodies laying there. So, because uh, they do have a, a good impact on uh, a lot of these rodents. We also kill a lot of turtles. And ground nesting birds have nested by late April, dropped their eggs. And so we do have an effect on those populations. Generally, these will be nest. It's just that the clutches are generally smaller and they have a uh, lower likelihood of, of survival. But the turtles and snakes are a big disadvantage from uh, late April burning. Burning in fall, winter, or at least earlier in spring alleviates it. They're gone. They're still in the ground. So you, most, a lot of people don't care about that. They say, that's a minor thing. I'm trying to manage the grassland. And if the wildlife's there, it's there, and if it, it, it evolved under a surviving grassland pile, so, um, so not, they don't worry too much about it. But some people, it's a big deal. Next is flexibility, and it's, like I just mentioned a little bit ago, uh, a lot of people may wait till late April to burn, and then all of a sudden it rains. And the grass grows, and it's so green, and then they say, well, dang it, I can't burn now. Because it just sprung up over and up. You start planting and burning a little bit early in the spring, you got a little more flexibility. You say, okay, well, I can get this burn in. Rather than wait until April 28th at 10 a.m. in the morning. Because you may not be able to burn that day. Since you're favoring cook some cool season grasses and your sedges, you're also able to put the animals out. A little bit earlier in the spring, there's something there for them to eat. And you can leave them on in the fall a little bit longer because there's green stuff there to eat. It's not as uh, dominated by warm season grasses as it is with the late spring one. And so then, to, to wrap this up section up on it, uh, it's still preached as being official that policy is you don't burn until late April. Even though your objective, you say, well, we can burn at different times depending on your object objective. The objective of most people in Flint Hills is uh, cattle management. And uh, so they burn at a time in which they think will be best for the cattle management, which is late April. Is erosion a factor in picking when you will? Well, it always has been. It always has been. Uh, in the past, that was one of the arguments they used. They said, "Okay, you're going to burn early. You're going to expose the, the ground to raindrop impact, to runoff. You don't have any protective cover on it. You're going to lose more soil moisture." And that was the big selling point from the uh, 30s, 40s. In the droughts of the 30s and the droughts of the 50s, that was a big selling point. It says you're going to lose your soil moisture. And that was the argument they used for why you had lower biomass production. Because you had lower soil moisture, so the grass produced less, and so uh, you uh, would have this 15 or 12 percent reduction in, in grass production. We have not seen it. Now, we've only operated uh, doing this for 20 years. So 20 years is a long time, but in the grand scheme of things, it's nothing. And the, the problem with the erosion and, and some, a lot of this, in fact, is that information was taken from different areas and said it, it applies like in western Kansas, then it ought to uh, be the same thing here. And it may not be that they may have very well have issues of soil erosion in western Kansas by burning early that's not applicable here. So uh, a, lot of, a lot of the recommendations on burning is based upon uh, other experiences and not research from tall grass 
And I'm not saying either, don't, don't mistake some of this talk. Of, uh, you can go out to Montana and get the same kind of results. Like Vernon, we're talking about Flint Hills, talk about first. And, and what we're saying is, is that we haven't seen any differences between fall and spring running uh, for all of you. Don't mean you can't say it. So we don't think moisture loss, erosion loss is an issue. Doesn't mean it can't be, it's just that we haven't seen any evidence of it. Okie dokie, finishing this up. You can manipulate your ve vegetation by burning at different times. This manipulation comes slow. You don't do a wham bam, get the immediate changes. It comes slow. And it takes repeated. You just don't do it once and, and think you're going to get it. it you got to keep at it. Uh, and then finally, the misinformation. I've hoped I've not enough. So, uh, uh, real briefly, uh, a summer burn to uh, talk about because a, it seems to be that it is now um, an issue that people are talking more and more about. And we set up in 1994 uh, two watersheds that we burned in some of that being in uh, late July or August. And uh, we do these only every two years because uh, we can't do them every year. And I just want to mention that the one or two graphs on it. Most people want to think about these uh, growing season burns as a means of getting rid of the woodies. Because in theory, a growing season burn, 100 degrees outside, a lot of fuel, you get a file, whips through an area, get a really, really hot file, kill some woodies. That's in theory. What we did under controlled burn conditions is the replicated watershed bounces around from year to year, doesn't <coughs> change at all, in the cover of woody species from summer burning. And this was just a comparison with the spring burning. That was on lowland sides, and the number of species of woody species also uh, did not change from summer burning. So, we, we didn't get the differences in woody species. Now, I know they, they talk about says this is the way to do it. But they're also talking about not uh, research conditions. What they're talking about is they had a wildfire go through an area that may have been burned for 20 years. It had tremendous mulch build up and uh, 100 degrees out, and you get a really, really hot fire, and it theoretically can wipe out some plants. But you can't burn that way under controlled conditions. We can't kill people when we're going out lighting a fire in 100 degrees. It's really, really tough on them anyway when we burn when it's in the 80s. And, and to keep the fire contained within the watershed. So to burn under controlled conditions, less than 15 mile an hour winds, and a, a two years of mulch build up, keeping the fire contained, and so that people don't die in the process, we're not able to kill woody species. So this whole concept of killing woody species under uh, summer burning is theoretically, but we can't see it under controlled conditions. Now, you know, there can be an exception. Three years ago we had a wildfire that came off the interstate in July, and it burned R20B. R20B had been unburned for about at that time, seven or eight years, had a lot of mulch build up. After that file, well, three weeks later, we burned the watershed right next to it, some of them, under controlled conditions. So just a difference of three weeks. The one that R20B, a year later, looked like a bomb had went off in it. It was wiped out. Nothing but junk plants, annuals, and some of these really low quality plants that grow in highly disturbed areas. The summer burn, it was burned under controlled conditions, fantastic. Look, just good old normal prairie. So because what we had did with the wildfire, with all that mulch build up and the wind going through, it generated a much harder fire. And so you can 
get control of different, you can get different uh, results from summer bunting depending upon when and how it's done. But all I'm saying is under controlled conditions in which you try to maintain it, we see very little differences. And most plants tolerate it quite well. But one, one thing you do see is a big increase in species richness. And most of the species richness plant, honestly, is annual reports. So 61% higher species, number of species in the summer bud than in the spring bud. How does so, summer compare to winter? Uh, it's, it's, uh, summer is much, much higher than winter. In fact, summer burning, in, which I talk about on the next section on, with the grazing, summer burning, the number of species in it is like a graze pasture. High number of species. And then just an overall uh, summary, big blue stem, no response on uplands, increases under lowlands. Any grass sedges, asters, both aerocoides and oblong foliars, increase in annual forage, increase for summer running. The others tolerate it with no effect at all. And none of these, notice, has a minus. No negative changes over time. Okay, okay. So it can be a tool, not only for um, uh, control, potentially some kind of woody if it was a uh, condition which you didn't have to worry about what was going on downwind, but it, uh, it's not a tool that's utilizable by most people in the Flint Hills because they got cattle out there and say, well, I can't burn my pasture for one of the cattle going to eat. But it still can be used, it still can be used as a uh, means for grazing, and I talk about it in the next section, of, of uh, burning an area, patch burning an area in the summertime, and then eight weeks later, that is green, green grass that the animals just go hog wild. So it can be a tool. And the, another thing it can be for small restoration areas, since switchgrass did not change over time with uh, uh, some of burning. It can be a potential way of saying, okay, I want to burn it, but they know that if you burn it any time of the year, spring, winter, or fall, you increase switchgrass. And most people that have these small areas of restor restored areas, they end up putting, well, I throw switchgrass out there. And the next thing you know, you have nothing but totally switchgrass dominated fruit. And all you do is favor switchgrass by burning it. But if you don't burn it, then you get the woodies to come in. So it, it, it's an issue. So what the heck do I do? Well, some of burning might be a solution in it because switchgrass didn't increase with some of burning. It didn't decrease, but it sure didn't increase. So that's it on, um, on the burning. Any other quick questions before we go to bison? The bison's not near as long.